How should investors pick amongst the thousands of cryptocurrencies to invest in? And should you be concerned about the rise of regulations, both domestically and abroad? We'll be discussing these themes with John Sarson. He is the CEO of Sarson Funds, a cryptocurrency asset management firm. Welcome to the show. Hi there, David. Thank you for having me on. John, it's your first time on Kiko. I want to talk about your funding your strategy first. You have a multitude of products, starting from a large cap blockchain fund all the way down to a stable coin index fund. Um, a variety of, uh, of products, very interesting. Before we get into them, I want to just get your overview, uh, your, your sort of philosophy on investing, so to speak, and uh, how it is that you pick individual uh, securities, cryptocurrencies, whatever you like to call them, and assign them into a basket or a portfolio. Um, thank you, yeah. Um, so I got into cryptocurrency because I'm a fanatic investor. I love investments. And around 2015, people started making money in an asset class called Bitcoin that I had not learned about. I was working uh, traditional Wall Street jobs, I, uh, distributing mutual funds and uh, in New York City. And I thought I was in the flow on the investment world but yet here was an investment that my colleagues and I didn't know anything about. And um, that evolved over the course of the past six years into a registered investment advisor focused on cryptocurrency, assisting high net worth individuals and other financial professionals get up to speed on this complicated asset class. Um, when we think about cryptocurrencies, we have to remember that they're not companies, they're not stocks. They don't have to deliver iPhones. They don't have to deliver Teslas. Uh, they're protocols. Uh, they're a protocol for transferring cash from peer to peer. That was the first line of the Bitcoin white paper that started this all. Uh, you know, these technologies are applications of blockchain technology uh, or distributed ledger technology. Um, mm -hmm. And the first killer app for blockchain technology is Bitcoin a peer-to-peer -peer cash transfer protocol. The reason I mention this is because when we're talking about protocols, it tends to be a winner-take-all environment. Um, there's nothing that stops Bitcoin from becoming the only way people transfer cash back and forth. And the ability of a protocol to scale is really very much infinite. Right. And uh, to give you an example, like hypertext transfer protocol, that's how we navigate the internet now. You know, we used to use file transfer protocol. And, but no one uses that really. We all just use hypertext transfer protocol. And if you could go back in time and, and buy the rights to hypertext transfer protocol, uh, that's um, that would have been a great investment. You probably get asked this question quite a lot. But uh, what are some of your favorite altcoins? If I were to ask you for some some coins that you think have the best investment potential over the next year or two, what do you think those would be? Um, well, I mentioned one Intel coin. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak briefly about Dogecoin. Dogecoin is very polarizing. People think, you know, how can there be so much value being stored and people making so much real money in Dogecoin when it was really kind of uh, started as a joke? Um, it really was started as a way to give people some cryptocurrencies that they could freely pit tip each other on the internet with and that didn't have a whole lot of you know, a, like um, a crude value so people wouldn't want to spend their Bitcoin. And so that's where we are today. People don't want to spend their Bitcoin. And so when the Dallas Mavericks decide they're going to take cryptocurrency, like they don't want to accept Bitcoin because people don't want to spend their Bitcoin. People are hodling their Bitcoin. Uh, but Dogecoin, which they do accept, like people are happy to spend that. That's kind of like their their pocket change that they can buy things on the internet with. It's a great transactional currency. And we look at, in addition to seeing who's best of breed in, in, a, in a particular vertical, we look at community and community engagement and community growth rates. And nothing, it, no community is more engaged or growing more quickly than Dogecoin. So um, we like Dogecoin and we have it in our portfolios. Uh, when you say growing quickly, John, you don't mean it's getting getting to become a bubble now. That's what some, that's what some investors are concerned about. You, you know, there's 150 million Bitcoin wallets approximately worldwide. Yeah. There's probably a billion people that would be organic users of Bitcoin because either they're unbanked 
or they live in uh, under an oppressive regime where Bitcoin offers them a solution. So the community around cryptocurrencies are going is going to grow another eight to 12 times in its size. And Dogecoin's community is going to uh, have similar growth over that period. To your earlier comment that Bitcoin tends to drag the market around, uh, what we're seeing really is adoption of digital money. And Bitcoin is the biggest digital money with the most on and off ramps in the most countries. And so that's where people start. Uh, but it's like a gateway drug. Once they get into Bitcoin, then they might get some Ethereum. Once they get into Ethereum, they can buy some ERC-20 tokens mm -hmm. in their browser, in their MetaMask wallet. And then they can buy some ETF or some NFTs and they can put their NFTs alongside of their Dogecoin and they can yeah. start to live more of a digital life. And this is really, this is a trend that no one's, no one's questioning that we're leading more digital lives, but yet they're questioning why digital money is becoming so popular. And right. And kind of include it. Back to your example, if I go to a Dunkin' Donuts, people behind me will be will be a little bit uh, annoyed that I'm taking 10 minutes to process a transaction. Uh, do you think there's going to be an emergence of protocols on top of Bitcoin that can be layered, like for example, Lightning Network, for example, that can make the peer-to-peer -peer transaction a little bit faster? Is that sort of the new trend right now, John? Um, there has been lots of attempts to do exactly that. And the Lightning Node is the, is the most well-known example of trying to make Bitcoin more useful. Uh, the reality is that Bitcoin's development community is very much committed to Bitcoin's core code. Um, it caused a mutiny when they tried to take the block size from two megabytes to 10 megabytes so that more transactions could fit into the block. This is when Bitcoin Cash was um, that, uh, forked from Bitcoin because the developing community couldn't agree on something so simple as that. The Lightning Node is a solution, uh, but it's not going to solve the the um, unaffiliated payment, high speed payment problems. Uh, Lightning Node will be more of a solution for a corporate client that wants to accept Bitcoin uh, and, and uh, signs up for the Lightning Node. Uh, so it's, it's part of the answer. But there'll be other coins that fit in there better. You know, um, blockchain technology and pay, paying for things is just one application. Um, IOTA, uh, which stands for Internet Things, the company out of Japan, is launching their blockchain. Uh, in They sell them in million, million IOTA uh, at a time. And it's being used by self-driving cars to speak to the cars around them. And when you attach a token to your data, then it removes spam from your network uh, because every data every data emission costs money and has to be sent on the blockchain. It also creates an immutable ledger. And as we get to the self-driving cars of the future, I don't want to put my family into a car going 100 miles an hour, two inches behind the car in front of it, just because the car in front of it says it's going 100 miles an hour. I want the network around that car to also agree that their data uh, is accurate and that that car is in fact going that direction at that speed. And I want it to be done in an immutable and um, unassailable way in blockchain technology and tokens flying back and forth um, at a very high speed on the IOTA blockchain enable that. Okay. What do you think, in your opinion, then, is the ideal cryptocurrency as a form of payment? You talked about Dogecoin. Is there something else that you like? Yeah, I like um, USDC. USDC just crossed $25 billion in uh, total assets. It's a project that is backed by Coinbase, Goldman Sachs, BlackRock, Fidelity. They um, are an on-ramp that will let people that don't want to invest in Bitcoin mm -hmm. or any other cryptocurrency get all the benefits of cryptocurrency payment ramps. You know, um, this is actually better than traditional banking. You know, USDC, which is basically the United States banking gold standard coin, for every USDC that's in circulation, 
there is the corresponding dollar in a bank vault at USDC's sponsor firm, which is a firm called Circle. And it's better than traditional money because it moves faster. And if it goes to the wrong place, you don't have to get it back. You can just turn it off. It's, it's, it's better, faster, cheaper, and it's winning the day, and it will continue to win the day. And that will become our payment currency for things that uh, we want to we pay, you know, traditional fiat um, vendor will accept U.S. dollar coin, because why would you not? Finally, let's talk about regulation now, John. Uh, we know that the technology exists for cryptocurrencies to serve as a viable form of payment. Visa, PayPal, among other platforms, are already accepting Bitcoin here in the United States. But if you look abroad now, let's take a look at China, what China did over the last week. They've banned 90% of their mining capacity, basically, over the weekend. They've outlawed over-the-counter trading of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So they've really taken a harder stance on crackdowns. Do you think that kind of uh, stance could be adopted here in the West? Do you think one day the government here in the U.S. would say, hey, ba hey PayPal, hey, Visa, enough with your Bitcoin transaction platforms, shut it down? You know, God bless America, but I don't see that happening. Um, yeah. You know, we are the most innovative country in the world. And part of the reason why we're the most innovative country in the world, is, and that includes financial innovation, is because the regulators um, come with a philosophy of first do no harm. And that's, that mentality is present at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, uh, that approved banks to custody and service digital assets late last year, spark, sparking this big rally in the price of digital assets. It's present at the SEC under the leadership of Gary Gensel uh, and um, Hester Peirce, uh, crypto mom. Uh, there's a provision being uh, loaded around saying that maybe there should be a two-year safe harbor provision where cryptocurrency companies don't have to worry about all of the SEC regulations that can be so onerous. Uh, for the first two years so that they don't stifle innovation. And, um, you, you know, it's, uh, it's kudos to these regulators uh, for being worried about stifling innovation because that's certainly what's happened in other countries where they've created kind of knee-jerk reaction laws, mm -hmm. outlawing cryptocurrencies or ICOs. I'm thinking about Korea in 2017. Mm -hmm. You know, what happened was those firms moved to Japan. And Japan welcomed them, and Japan took a piece of Korea's financial sector. And like uh, that will happen to every country in the G20 that right. unilaterally uh, decides that they don't want to allow cryptocurrency transactions you know, on their on their shores. So, so I don't see that happening. Uh, I think that um, we're we are in a very positive and a constructive place um, when it comes to regulation in this country. And you know that's what I spend a lot of time. Uh, analyzing and uh, worrying about on behalf of my clients because uh -huh. that's the big risk, you know, the, that all of a sudden Bitcoin becomes illegal. And what we're hearing from the Fed is Bitcoin seems inefficient. We have better ways to do this. What we're not hearing from the Fed is the dollar is the only currency allowed in this country. You know, we're going to go back to an era worldwide where there's lots of currencies and different social groups have diff had their own currency. Uh -huh. And uh, that was really more the way it was in this country 150 years ago, where each bank issued their own banknotes. Um, and um, really, the the anomaly in the history of humanity is has been like so few uh, store of value instruments or transaction instruments. You know, Bitcoin's clearly a store of value instrument for people. Whether how well it works is is debatable, but it's clearly being used for that. It's also a transactional medium for people. You know, we mentioned it's not going to be the currency you buy a Dunkin' Donuts coffee with, but if you're going to buy a tanker full of oil two years from now, you're going to pay with Bitcoin. $30 million of Bitcoin for that tanker full of oil, it sure beats going to get dollars to send to another, to the vendor in another country that they then have to turn the dollars back into their home currency. That's the past. You know, better, so, faster, cheaper is going to end on the back of Bitcoin. So you don't agree with criticism that governments around the world, not just the United States, are more concerned about preserving their own fiat state issue currencies and not having anything compete with that. Oh, oh very. That's very much the case. I mean, like that's why China. That's that's the um, reason behind China's movements. Clearly, they they 
like to control capital flows. I mean, that's how they manipulate their currency. They need to keep their currency weak to create manufacturing jobs. And they have a, a finally a way to let their domestic currency be manipulated and have a, and have a uh, international trade currency, which they never really had before because of the capital controls. And it's all in, on the back of the DCEP, the Digital Currency Electronic Payments Project, which they're already uh, pioneering in Sejuan province. And that's actually where they outlawed the Bitcoin mining as well. Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin is an affront to dictators. And it's a front to communist economies. And Zimbabwe has also banned Bitcoin. So China and Zimbabwe are going to ban Bitcoin. And I don't want to be on the same side of the boat as those two countries in, on this particular issue. Okay, so John, we've talked about regulation abroad, uh, but what about uh, regulation here in the United States? Do you think regulations will evolve to be uh, a little more proactive in combating what investors believe is a rising threat in uh, the use of cryptocurrencies for illicit financing and illegal activities? For example, the ransomware attack on the Colonial Pipeline uh, not too long ago. What can the government do now to combat this threat? Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an important question. And a year ago, the government was a little bit behind the eight ball when it came to kind of staffing out their cryptocurrency divisions. Uh, but that's changed dramatically in the last 12 months. There's been a real emphasis placed on getting cryptocurrency talent on board at regulators. Uh, we all know that the IRS is now tracking crypto transactions. It's easy to track crypto transactions. It's hard -er, to triangulate who owns cryptocurrency wallets, but not that hard. Uh, there's firms like Chainalysis um, that specialize in doing exactly that, analyzing blockchains and figuring out who owns the wallets. And then the IRS software can run and you're gonna get a tax bill. It's really important to not believe that you're going to get away without paying taxes on your cryptocurrency. That was 2018, not, not 2019 and not 2020. But the more uh, specific question, about financial crimes, uh, you know, financial crimes are uh, investigated by a, a group called FinCEN, uh, stands for Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're the guys that will go after you if you launder money. And they just made a strategic hire. They hired the an executive from Chainalysis uh, to come and run their cryptocurrency division. So they now have the smartest, one of the smartest people in the cryptocurrency ecosystem working at the financial crimes enforcement network. And um, it, I would warn any listener that what looks like a private dark web transaction to you is not a private transaction. And I would not be surprised to see certain privacy centric blockchains such as Monero being deemed illegal in this country because there's only one reason to have them uh, and that is to that was, of yeah, that, that was my next question. There are privacy coins specifically for this reason, and you think they might be more heavily regulated. That's interesting. Look, I'm not, I'm yeah. not claiming to be smarter than FinCEN. I just, I just, you know, it, it just, if, I, if I were to make, you know, a create a wallet using a fake profile, how could they trace it back to my real identity? I mean, obviously they figured this out. I'm just curious. Yeah, so like, um, you know, all of a sudden you've got, you know, 20 Bitcoin, and then you buy something with them and it gets shipped to your house. You buy a Lamborghini and they, and they ask for your name. And like all of this, and like they triangulate uh, purchases and they can do it across an unlimited number of wallets. It, it, they're algorithms that find you, not humans. Or I could use and it to finance hackers to attack uh, infrastructure. Yeah, or, or you, pay, you, you pay like something, you just, you do anything that attaches to you with that money or a version of that money seven iterations from now, and they got you. So it's not as private as you may think. And if you're using a, a blockchain like Monero that's designed to conceal your identity, like that's what senders have a problem with. And that's what they talk about. They talk about money laundering and they talk about financing terrorists. And uh, at Sarsen Funds, we don't invest in privacy tokens uh -huh. because we don't want to fund terrorists, but mostly because institutions aren't going to invest in them because they're going to be made illegal in this country. And there goes the investment thesis. So like, I, I understand that everyone's worried about government overreach, but like, don't do illegal things and you want to do so work. Sure. So, so you don't, you don't think privacy tokens just to sum up are good investments exactly for that reason. 
Yeah, they're not going to get the institutional money. Institutions right. are afraid of crypto and they take a wide berth from anything that's controversial. Yeah. And they'll take a wide berth from privacy tokens. We've already seen yeah. it happening. They're underperforming the rest of the cryptocurrency market. And again, real quick, the uh, skeptics of Bitcoin, again, Bitcoin, um, skeptics of Bitcoin will point to the exact same reason. They think that Bitcoin can be used for illicit activities. And so eventually the government will have to shut it down. You've already talked about this extensively throughout the interview, but just in one, <laughs> in 30 seconds, how would you shut down that argument? You know, it's an unstoppable payment method, but it's not uh, a really great uh, way to do illegal activities. The head of the DEA has said that she would love if, if drug dealers continued to use Bitcoin because <laughs> once again, the whole network. We saw the same thing happen last year with the child porn ring where they were all using Bitcoin and yeah. they have now immutable evidence against each one of them, immutable. So like, um, it's, not a, it, it's not as private as, as like a, we may have been led to believe or at least right. software figured it, you know, technology cracked the privacy and uh, that's, that's okay. All right. Uh, so you've heard that criminals, if you want to, if you want to break the law, use cash or a privacy token, that's probably going to be banned somewhere down the line. <laughs> John, thank you very much for coming on the show today. Excellent thoughts. Thank you. My pleasure, David. Take care. Thank you for watching Kiko News. I'm David Lynn.